When you first start Adobe Premiere Pro, this is what you're going to see. This is the start screen. And there are a couple of options on here. The two that we're really interested in are the option to create a new project and the option to open an existing project. A Premiere Pro project file is a file like any other. All of your creative decisions are going to be stored in that file. We can open one of these up by double clicking on them, but I'm going to show you from inside the start screen first of all. I'm just going to click back into Premiere Pro and I'm going to click on Open Project. You should be familiar with this dialog. This is in Windows, of course. This is Windows Explorer. And if we were on Mac OS, this would be a Finder dialog. It's just going to allow us to open a file. So I'm going to select this 0101, create a project, Premiere Pro project file, and I'm going to click Open. And here we are now in Premiere Pro looking at this project. There's not much going on right now. Over the bottom right here, we've got the Timeline panel. I'm just going to click a little earlier in the sequence here, where you can see we've got a number of clips all lined up, ready to make a program. And when I do that at the top right in this program monitor, you can see this is the program monitor. It's showing us our master sequence. We get the visuals from that series of clips. Another important panel for you to be familiar with is this one down at the bottom left. This is the project panel. And you see every panel has its name at the top left hand corner. This is the project panel and it's showing me the contents of the project I've just opened, 0101 Create a Project. Inside of this panel I've got something that looks a bit like a folder. It's a bin in Premiere Pro and in that bin I've got some clips. If I double click to open one of these you can see it opens in this source monitor at the top left corner. This is for previewing the videos that you've got in your project. You can play them back and just have a look and see if you want to use them or not. And over on the right here, the program monitor is for looking at the sequence that you're building. That's the film that you're making, if you like. OK, so that's how to open a project. I'm just going to go to the File menu and I'm going to choose Close Project. And Premiere Pro has invited me to save changes. There aren't any really. But you'll notice up at the top here next to the project name, it's quite useful because we've got the location of the project as well. I'm on a Windows machine, so this is a C drive rather than a system drive or another kind of plugged in drive. And I've got this little asterisk next to the name that tells me that some kind of change has happened. That change might just be that I'm looking at a different part of the project, so I'm not too concerned. And I'm going to click No. Back on the Start screen, this time I'm going to click New Project. I'm going to call this First Project. And if I click Browse, we get a familiar Browse dialog where we can choose the location for the new project file. You can always move it later on, of course, but I'm happy with it being here in my media folder. So I'll choose Select Folder. I'm not worried about the rest of the options for now. I'm just going to click OK. And here we are in an empty Premiere Pro project. The first thing we're going to want to do is get some media in, get some video files into the project. So I'm going to go to the media browser. And the media browser is going to allow me to look through the contents of my storage to find the clips, the video files, the photos and graphics and so on that I want to use in my project. I'm going to browse into the media files folder and I'm not going to pay too much attention right now, but I'm going to select some of these clips. I'm just going to scroll down here and actually I think I'm pretty much happy to have all of this, so I'm going to press, in this case, Control A, or that'd be Command A on Mac OS to select everything here. I can make individual selections if I like, but I'm happy to have all of these. And I'm going to right click on any of them and I'm going to choose Import. And there we are. Now, inside our project panel, we've got a list of clips. These are pieces of video. And if I double click on any of these, they open up in the source monitor for me to take a look and decide if I want to use them. So now we have a project file with some media imported and we're ready to get started reviewing our footage and editing clips together. For now though, I'm going to go to the file menu again and I'm going to choose close project. I will save the changes and we're back to the start screen. So that's opening an existing project, creating a new one and importing some media ready for you to start working in Adobe Premiere Pro. It's helpful to understand the key Adobe Premiere Pro interface design elements, as this will make it easier to explore the application and learn new features. Let's begin by opening an existing project. I'm going to double click here on this 0102 interface overview project file and double clicking it is going to open the project in Premiere Pro. 
The first thing I'm going to do here is make sure I'm in the editing workspace. Now, a workspace is really just a preset layout for the application. I'm going to move things around a little bit here. I've got a number of different panels that I can work with. I'm just going to shift these around in a really noticeable way so that it's easy for you to see the difference. And right at the top of the screen, I've got this word editing, which is the editing workspace. We've got a number of different workspaces for different purposes, color, work, uh, effects, audio, and so on. Now let's say I know that this workspace is wrong. I'm gonna click on this menu right next to the word editing, and I'm gonna choose reset to saved layout. And that's gonna put things back the way they were. I recommend that you go through this process at the beginning of every workflow that you follow, every tutorial that you watch, every book that you read on how to use Premiere Pro, because you'll find that pretty much all of the lessons that you see will use the default layout so that people can follow along. Now on the subject of panels, I want to draw your attention to this blue highlight outline. Right now the timeline panel is active, that's where you build sequences and make movies in Premiere Pro. Now, if I click the bottom left, the project panel is active. Depending on the active panel, you'll find that you get different menu options and things will work a little bit differently in Premiere Pro. So it's important to know which panel is active before you begin. Just keep an eye out for that blue outline. Each panel has a name at the top of it. Right now, I'm in the project panel. Next to the name, you'll find a panel menu, just like the one we used a moment ago to reset our workspace. This menu is called the panel menu, and it gives you options that relate specifically to that panel. It's important to be clear about which kind of menu you're looking in. Here, I'm looking in the panel menu, but you'll notice, for example, on the timeline, there's a wrench icon for what's called a settings menu. In both cases, you're going to see options that relate specifically to the panel you're clicking on. Where you see the name of a panel, in this case the project panel, it's referred to as a tab. So here we've got the tab for the project panel. Now I'm clicking on the tab for the media browser. Again, it's good to know the name of that because if you look up tutorials, you'll find that these different name headings are referred to as tabs. And now you'll know where you're looking. We also have a right click menu. If I right click on one of these items in the sequence over in the timeline panel, you can see I've got a number of options that relate specifically to that clip. And you might already be able to see that selection is extremely important in Premiere Pro. I'm getting options for that clip, not the one next to it. Every panel in Adobe Premiere Pro is listed in the window menu. So if you're ever hunting for a panel, don't worry about it. Just look for it on this menu and it'll come up when you select it. Here, for example, I'm choosing the media browser and now the media browser has come to the front. Even though it was kind of already displayed in the interface, it was hidden behind the project panel, which I'm gonna go back to right now. So now I'm gonna to go to the file menu. I'm gonna choose close project. And that's an overview of the key design elements in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm working with Project 0103 Import Media. And you can find that project file with the media files associated with this lesson. You can just double click to open it up. Your projects might include video, music, voiceover, photos, graphics, and animation files. And let's import some video clips and learn about the way they're linked to your project file. I'm going into the Media Browser panel. And I'm just going to browse for our media and go into this media files folder. On the left, you've got all of the folders on your computer. On the right, you're seeing the contents of the folders you select. Right now, I'm here in the media files folder, the same one we looked at just now. If I double click on one of these, I'm gonna double click on this clip right here. It'll open in the source monitor. And once it's here, I can press play if I want. Or I can take this blue so-called playhead and drag to a different section of the video. Notice I don't have to click on the playhead to move it. I can just click where I want it to go. I'm going to select a few of these clips. I'm just going to click on the first one up here and scroll down a bit. And I'm going to hold the shift key down to make a list selection and get six clips. I'm going to right click on any one of the selected clips and choose import and they'll appear in my project panel. Importing a clip creates what's called a master clip in Premiere Pro, which is really a shortcut to the media file. I'm just gonna click on the background of the project panel to deselect these clips. And you can see that I'm in list view and I've got some information about them. I've got the frame rate and so on. That's the number of frames per second for these video clips. 
I can also switch to the icon view by clicking this button at the bottom left hand corner and this is perhaps a little bit more useful. I've now got the visuals from the clips. Premiere Pro knows the location of the media files that clips link to and if the media moves you'll need to tell Premiere Pro where it is. Within the project file we can organize our clips using special folders called bins and this is a term used originally by film editors and it's stuck when editors switched to nonlinear editing. You can create a bin by clicking this button at the bottom right corner of the project panel. I'm going to call this Shots. I'm clicking away to apply the name and if I double click it'll open in its own frame. You'll notice that the bin has exactly the same options that the project panel has. There's a shortcut to doing this as well. I'm going to select three of these clips. I'm just clicking on the first one and I'm holding the shift key and clicking on the last. And I'm going to drag these three clips onto that same new bin button. Those clips have now been put into the bin and I'll call this one Shots 2. You can see the name is already highlighted. And if I double click, you can see I've now got my bin called Shots 2 with those clips in it. I'll just drag this so you can see the Shots bin as well. You can even put bins in bins. So now I'm going to select both of these bins. I'm holding the shift key down again and I'm going to drag them both onto the new bin button and I'm going to call that new bin media. And now if I double click to open this up, you can see it's a bin with two bins in it. So it's a bit like folders in Windows or Mac OS. Speaking of folders, if I toggle back over to our media and I'm going to just browse up to the main media folder, I'm going to rename our media files folder something different. In fact, I'll just put the word different in here. That changes the location of the clips. Of course, I've renamed the folder containing them. So if I go back to Premiere Pro right away, all of the clips get these question marks. They go offline and you probably just saw there Premiere Pro found the media again and relinked to it. If I double click on one of these, up it comes. I'm just going to close some of these bins because they're getting in the way in my interface. And there it is. I'm just going to go back and I'll undo. I'm pressing Control Z here on Windows, that'd be Command Z on Mac OS. Go back into Premiere Pro and there, it just flashed up and found the media again. It's possible Premiere Pro will ask you where one of the clips are if you've really moved them to a different location on your computer. If that happens, you can just browse to the first clip that's missing and Premiere Pro will find the rest. Notice as well, if I right click on one of these clips, I can choose Reveal in Explorer. This is Reveal in Finder in Mac OS. And there's the clip highlighted. If I go back into Premiere Pro and just click on the name of this clip, I'm just clicking and then clicking again. Let's say I call this Trees. I'm clicking away to apply the name. I'm going to toggle back to the media and you'll see that the file name hasn't changed. Remember, the clips inside of Premiere Pro really are just links to the media files. They are not the media files themselves. So renaming the shortcut doesn't change the media file. So that's an overview of importing media into your project, ready to edit in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm working with a project file called 0104 Build a Sequence. And you can find that with the media included with this lesson. Just double click on the project file to open it. Clips in the project panel are ready to be combined creatively by adding them to a sequence. Now a sequence is a container and as you may be able to tell from the name, clips added to a sequence are organized into a series of items that will play one after another. And let's create one now. This is a simple project with just three clips. I'll switch this to the icon view so you can see the contents of them. The clips are already imported. And you can see the timeline panel says drop media here to create sequence. So let's do that. I'm going to drag on the blank space of the project panel to lasso across these three clips. So they're all three selected and I'm going to drag them into the timeline panel. They've been added in the order I selected them one after another with time going from left to right. I'm just going to click and drag up here at the far left of the timeline panel so you can see the thumbnails for the clips. This area in the timeline panel is called the track header. At the top here you can see some numbers indicating the passage of time and if I click on those numbers you can see the blue playhead here moves to where I click. The playhead indicates the frame that I'm going to be looking at. I can play the contents of my sequence by clicking the play button under the program monitor. 
that becomes a stop button, so you can click that to start playback too. You can also use the space bar, just like this. As the playhead moves across a cut, you'll see that we transition from one clip to another. And you can also drag the playhead across the sequence. So here, I'm moving quite quickly through the content. When this sequence was created, which happened when I dragged the clips into the timeline panel, it also appeared in the project panel. It has the same name as the first clip selected. And you'll notice that there's a little icon. I'm going to click away to deselect it. There's a different icon for sequences, as you'll see on clips. Just at the bottom right-hand corner of the thumbnail. If I go to the list view, you can see the icons a little bit more clearly. I'm going to click on the name for this, just once to select, and once again to highlight the text, and I'm going to call it First Sequence. I'll just click away to apply that. Now you can have as many sequences as you like, and professional editors sometimes combine sequences in creative ways. I want to draw your attention in the timeline panel over here on the right to these thin lines dividing sections of the timeline panel. Each of these is a track you can put clips onto. I've put clips here onto video 1, and you can see we've got V1, V2, V3, and so on. We've got A1, A2, A3 for audio. You can just about make out the waveforms for these clips as well. That's showing how loud the audio is that's associated with these particular video clips. All the audio tracks play together, but video tracks play one above the other. So if you had a title or a graphic, you would put that on an upper video track, maybe V2 or V3, to play in front of a lower track. Video and audio clips are separate in the timeline panel. But because these clips came together, when you click on the video, it selects the audio too, and vice versa. If I want to remove a clip, I can just make sure it's selected by single clicking and hit the delete key, and it's gone. I'm going to undo that with Control z on Windows, that would be Command-Z on Mac OS. If I want to remove this clip without leaving a gap, I can hold the Shift key while I press delete. I'm going to go back to the icon view in the project panel and find that clip again, here it is and drag it onto the timeline. And you'll notice when I do it, it snaps into position. See as I drag there, it jumps into position just at the end of the series. Releasing the mouse button places the clip. Another way to create a new sequence is to select a number of clips in the project panel. Here I'm holding the shift key down to select all three of these clips again. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose new sequence from clip. It has the same effect as dragging the clips into an empty timeline panel. And right away, you can see the new sequence has been created right here in the project panel. So that's how you build a new sequence, add and remove clips in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm working in Project 0201, working with the project panel. You can access that project file with the media that comes with this lesson. Just double click on it to open it up in Premiere Pro. The project panel is where you'll import, locate, find, organize, and preview your clips. Let's get a little more familiar with this important part of the Adobe Premiere Pro interface. At the bottom left corner of the project panel, we have this list view and icon view. If I switch to the icon view, I'm getting a thumbnail representing the contents of this master sequence. We can see that over here in the timeline panel as well. Back in the list view, I'm going to expand this bin called Media. I'm just going to click on the Disclosure triangle there, and now you can see we've got quite a few clips already imported into this project. At the bottom of the project panel, there's a navigator, and if I click and drag along, you can see quite a bit of information about these clips. Here, for example, the Video Info heading is giving me the image resolution of these clips. If you click on a heading, Premiere Pro will sort the items in the project panel based on that heading. Here I'm clicking on the name heading, and it's reversing the sort order. See the direction of this little simplified arrow? I'll click again, and now we're back into regular alphabetical order. I'm going to double-click on this media bin to open it in its own floating panel. And remember, bins in Premiere Pro have the same controls as the project panel, so I can switch this to the icon view as well. At the bottom left, I have the option to change the size of these thumbnails. I can make them really pretty big. I'm going to resize this panel. 
So you can see that each of these can become kind of a source window for you to check out your contents. If I hover the mouse over a thumbnail, I get a preview where the left edge is the beginning of the clip and the right edge is the end. It's a very quick way to see the contents of your clips. This feature in Premiere Pro is called Hover Scrub. If I single click to select a clip rather than double clicking, which would open it in the source monitor, I get a mini timeline, a little indicator of where I am in the clip. I can click this mini playhead and drag it to different positions. And I can use the spacebar to play back and stop. I should note that these clips have been renamed to make them a bit easier to find. And that's also useful for searching. At the top of the bin, there's a search field. And you can type anything you like in here to find clips that match the text you type. So if I type in the word kids, you can see all the other clips are hidden and only this clip with the word kids in the name remains. I'm going to click the X here to clear that search field so we can see the rest of the clips. If I close the bin as well and hide the contents of this bin by clicking the disclosure triangle right next to the name here in the project panel, you'll see that the same feature works. In fact, it'll reveal clips that would otherwise be hidden. If I type in the word kids, well, I don't even need to make it to the end of the word. You can see that the clip has been displayed. And in fact, the sequence has been hidden. Any item at all in the project panel that does not match the search will be hidden. I'll just clear that search field again. So that's an introduction to the project panel in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm using the O202 Source and Program Monitors project. And you can find that with the media that comes with this lesson. Just double click on the project file to open it. Most of the time you'll invest in video editing will be spent watching clips and making creative choices about them. You'll use the Source Monitor up here to preview clips and the Program Monitor over here on the right to preview the sequences you add them to. So let's learn a little bit more about the source and program monitors. You can double click on any clip in the project panel to open it in the source monitor. You can play and stop using this button at the bottom, or you can use the spacebar. At the bottom left hand corner, you can see we've got this series of eight digits. In fact, we've got something very similar over on the right. And this is called time code. It's measuring where we are in the clip in terms of hours, that's the first number, minutes, seconds, and individual frames. I can tell by looking at the bottom right hand corner here, the duration of the clip. It's zero hours, zero minutes, 13 seconds, and 14 frames long. But the bottom left hand corner is telling me where I am relative to all of the media that the camera recorded originally. It's pretty common for professional camera operators to begin at different hours. We weren't 6 hours and 42 minutes into this shot. The camera probably began recording at 6 hours just to make it easier to identify one batch of media from another. As we move through the clip, you can see these numbers change. If I click and drag at the bottom of the clip, I can move to view different parts of it. This could be a quick way of familiarizing yourself with your media. And in fact, clicking and dragging in this way is called scrubbing. If you want to move through the clip more precisely, you can use these one frame forward and one frame backwards buttons. You can also use the arrow keys on the keyboard. Here's the right arrow and the left arrow. It's quite possible you won't want to use all of a clip. Sometimes you'll have a very long recording where you only want 5 or 10 seconds. And you can tell Premiere Pro which part of the clip you want using special marks. These are called in or out marks. The in mark is the beginning of the part you want. And we can add that mark by clicking the mark in button right here. And I'll move my playhead a bit later in the clip and click the mark out button to specify the end of the part that I want. If I use this clip anywhere in a sequence, I'll only get this piece that's highlighted between the marks. I can update the marks anytime I like. So if I click earlier on in the clip here in this mini timeline, I can click the mark in button again and you can see the clip updates. You'll notice as well, now I've chosen a part of the clip, this duration indicator at the bottom right corner has gotten shorter. Now we've just chosen 6 seconds and 23 frames. These marks are persistent. You can close the project and they'll still be applied when you next view the clip. If you want to remove the marks, you can right click in the picture and choose clear in and out. The program monitor has the same controls as the source monitor. 
you can play, stop, and so on. One major difference, of course, is that it's showing the contents of the sequence that we've created down at the bottom. If I scrub through the program monitor, it'll scrub the playhead in the sequence as well. There are in and out marks here too. But when you add them, they're actually added to the sequence. And that's for a more advanced workflow that we don't need for now. So I can right click in the program monitor and choose clear in and out. Or for that matter, I can right click in the sequence right at the top where the numbers are and choose clear into out as well. In a way, you could say that this timeline at the bottom of the program monitor is a mini version of the full timeline below it. That's an introduction to the source and program monitors in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm using the 0203 Explore the Timeline Panel project file. You can find this with the media files that accompany this lesson. The Timeline Panel is where you'll build your sequences, arrange clips, make simple audio adjustments, and change the timing of edits. I've got a basic sequence here that has a long music clip. There it is. I single clicked to select it and a number of video clips. Here we are. I'm single clicking to select each of these and highlight them. When I play, as the playhead arrives at a new clip, we'll see the contents of that clip in the program monitor. So constructing a sequence is largely placing clips one after another from left to right inside the timeline panel. You'll notice that we've got video tracks and audio tracks, and there's a line dividing them that you can click on and drag to change which part of the sequence you're looking at. As your sequences become more complex, this dividing line might become more useful. Note that I'm clicking here to the left of the line dividing the track headers from the tracks themselves, not in between the tracks in the main part of the timeline panel. There's a very useful keyboard shortcut that you can use to make any panel in Premiere Pro full screen, and it's the Accent Grav key. I'm just pressing it right now. Whichever panel your mouse cursor is over will go full screen, and you can press the button again to go back to the regular size. Now my cursor's over the project panel, full screen, and back again. The location of that key does vary, so you may have to search for it on your keyboard. Each video track in the timeline panel has a track output option. Here, I'm just clicking the eyeball to turn off track output for video one. And now, I'll still get the music if I play, but none of the pictures. I'll just click that button to turn the track back on. You also have a mute option for audio tracks. If I click this M for mute track and play, I'm pressing the space bar now. No audio. I'll turn that back off and the music returns. You'll notice that you can click and drag to move clips around on the timeline. In fact, it's a single operation. You don't need to click and release and then click and drag. I can just drag in a single step. And you'll notice if I drag over to the left, this clip segment, as it's called, snaps into position. You feel it more than you see it, but you, you can just about see that clip jumps into position at the end of the previous clip. It lines up perfectly. This feature is called snapping, and you can turn it off and on at the top left of the timeline panel by clicking this button here, snap. I can also select a number of clips by lassoing. I'm going to click and drag here to make a marquee selection. And now that I've got four clips selected, I can move them all together. Selection is important in Premiere Pro. And of course, you can tell which clips are selected because they're highlighted. Notice also that we have the option to resize these track headers quite a lot. Again, I'm clicking to the left of the line here where all of the controls are. I can make these waveforms really quite tall. And you'll notice that some of the controls in the track header are just not visible until you make the track header taller. If you have a mouse wheel, you can use that to change the height as well. There's a navigator at the bottom of the timeline panel which is also a zoom control. You can click on these handles to zoom in and out. And you'll notice at the top left of the timeline panel, we have a time code indicator. This is where we are in our sequence based on hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. So that's an overview of the main features of the timeline panel 
in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm using the 0301 Create a New Sequence Premiere Pro project file. You can find that with the media associated with this lesson. Just double click on the Premiere Pro project file itself to open it in Premiere Pro. When you add clips to a sequence, their frame size and frame rate are automatically adjusted to match the sequence so everything will play smoothly. You'll want sequence settings to match your clips to minimize conversion and maximize playback quality. Let's take a look at those settings. I'm going to create a new sequence in this project by clicking at the bottom of the project panel on this new item menu. I'm going to go into the list and choose sequence and this brings up the new sequence dialog. The settings for sequences in Premiere Pro are based on camera formats rather than output formats. I'm going to expand the digital SLR category and I'm going to expand 1080p which is one of the settings that you can get in a DSLR camera and I'm going to choose this one DSLR 1080p 30. Choose a preset that matches your original camera material and click OK. I'm going to click on the name of the sequence that's just been created and let's give this a name. I'll call this Travelog. Just as a little footnote to this, you'll notice in the project panel that if you have text selected and you press the carriage return key, which is the enter key to the right of the letters on your keyboard, Premiere Pro tends to jump down the list selecting the next option. But if you have the characters selected, as I do now, and you press the enter key on a numerical keypad, that's over on the far end of a keyboard with the full numerical keys, then it'll just apply that text. Now, creating a sequence using a sequence preset gives you the most control, but it does mean you need to know the settings. And look what happens when I take one of these clips and drag it into the sequence I've just created. I get a clip mismatch warning. This clip does not match the sequence's settings. Do you want to change the sequence to match the clip's settings? This means you can get the settings wrong safely because Premiere Pro is going to give you this option to automatically change those settings when you add a clip. So let's do that. Let's change sequence settings. That clip is now in the timeline ready for us to work on. But it's pretty short and that's because we're zoomed out quite a long way in the timeline panel. To see this more clearly, I'm going to zoom in. And the easy way to do that is to take the ends of the navigator and move them. So I'm going to click on the end here and drag in to shorten the navigator. And as I do, you can see that we're zooming in and in and into the timeline. And now we can see that clip a little more clearly. I'm also going to click between these two track headers, between video one and video two, the first and the second video tracks. And I'm going to drag up so I can see the thumbnail as well. Now that you've seen Premiere Pro automatically update the settings for a sequence based on a clip, you can easily make use of an even better shortcut. I'm going to take one of these other clips, and again, I'm just single clicking here, I'm not double clicking, because if I double click, it opens in the source monitor. So back in the project panel, I'm going to drag this clip icon onto that same button menu, the new item menu. You see the little plus symbol there, it means I'm going to create a new sequence. I'm going to release the mouse and now I have a sequence that is automatically based on that clip. I don't need to know anything about the settings. I don't really need to know much about the clip at all. The sequence has been created with just the right settings to match it. And you can see the name of the sequence matches the clip too. People shelter from the rain, but you can see the icon is different. That icon is for a sequence. So let's call this uh, the rain sequence, just so it's easy to spot. And I'm pressing that Enter key at the end of my keyboard. Not only can you drag one clip onto the new item menu, you can actually drag multiple clips. I'm going to select the first item on the list here. Let's say I know that these are the shots I want. I'm going to hold the Shift key down and I'm going to click on the last clip on the list. And I'm going to drag all four of these onto the new item menu. And now you can see right away, I'll just resize the track header here. There are the four clips. And you can see, once again, the new sequence has taken the name from the first clip. I'll just call this uh, More Rain, <laughs> just so we can see it in the panel. So that's how you create a new sequence in Adobe Premiere Pro, ready to add some clips. For this lesson, I'm working with the Premiere Pro project file 0302, Add Clips to a Sequence. You can find that project file in with the media associated with this lesson. Double-click to open the project file in Premiere Pro. Once you have a sequence, 
you'll be ready to add some clips. Premiere Pro is a flexible editing system and allows you to work in a number of ways. Let's check it out. One way to add clips to a sequence is to drag them into the timeline panel. So here I've got a shot called Football in the Rain and I can drag this straight over to the timeline panel and drop it. And there it is. You'll notice that I'm tending to drop clips always on the Video 1 track with the associated audio on Audio 1. And this is more than just a force of habit. Remember, audio tracks all play together, but video tracks play in front of each other. Anything on video 2 will appear in front of anything on video 1. And let's try that. I'm going to take another clip and drag that up onto video 2. And you'll notice when I do that Premiere Pro automatically puts the audio for this clip on audio 2 as well. So when I release the mouse, we've now got video and audio. Looking at these two audio clips, seems to me there isn't actually any sound in this audio. So it's not going to make too many issues when we play back and the two pieces of audio are mixed. But still, I'll just scrub across the top of the timeline here. Let me resize a little so you can see the thumbnail of that Great Forest clip. And watch when the Great Forest clip begins in the program monitor. You can almost imagine that this blue mark at the top of the playhead is a camera looking down on the timeline. And anything on top appears in front of anything underneath. You can also drag clips straight from the source monitor. So here I'm clicking in the middle of the picture and I'm dragging down to the timeline. And I'll just put this right there, I think, on video one and audio one. Remember that if you have added in and out marks, as I have here in this clip, at the beginning and end, you see we've just lost the ends of the clip, then they're always going to be honored. It doesn't matter if you're Bring in the clip from the project panel down here or up in the source monitor. If you've added in and out marks, you'll just get that partial selection in your sequence. At the bottom of the source monitor, there are two icons, drag video only and drag audio only. And as you can guess, if I drag into the timeline using this icon, I'm only going to get the video part of the clip. Notice there's no audio there because I used this film strip icon instead of taking the whole thing from the middle of the picture. So that's some fairly intuitive ways that you can add clips to a sequence in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm working with 0303 Remove Clips from a Sequence. That's a project file you can find with the media associated with this lesson. Just double click on the project file to open it. A large part of video editing is not adding content, but removing it. You'll often find you have clips in a sequence you would like to remove. Let's look at some approaches to this. I've got a simple sequence with uh, four or five clips in it. And if I select this second clip, Kids Rolling a Tire, and hit the Delete key, Premiere Pro leaves a gap. And that might be what I want to do, because I've decided I don't want that shot, but I do want to put something else in there, and I don't want to move anything around. I'll just fill in the gap later on. I'm just going to undo that by pressing Control-Z. That's Command-Z on macOS. If I want to remove this clip and not leave a gap, I can select it as I have here by single-clicking on it, and I can hold the Shift key down while I press the Delete key. In this way, the Shift key is being used as a modifier key. And if you're familiar with using the Control key on Windows or the Command key on macOS, with keys like A for selecting all or S for saving, then you'll be familiar with the principle. Hold the Shift key down while you press the Delete key and then release the Shift key. Now I'm going to undo again. And this time I'm going to select multiple clips in this sequence by holding down the Shift key again. So it's a different use of the Shift key. I've already got one clip selected right at the end. So I'm holding the Shift key now and I'm single clicking to select the clip in the middle and I'm still holding the Shift key and I'm single clicking to select the clip at the beginning. Remember, selection is really important in Premiere Pro. So whatever you have selected is what you're working on. In this case, my work is to delete the clips. So I'm pressing the delete key and those three clips have gone. I'm going to undo that again. And this time I'm going to go to the track select forward tool and I'll click again here on the kids rolling a tire clip and I'll press delete again. Now I've got a bit of a problem because the track select forward tool actually selects everything on every track from this point forward. So I'm just going to undo and this time I'm going to hold the shift key again to change the way the track select forward tool works. Now I've got a single arrow. You can just see there without the shift key, I have two with it. I have one. And now if I click, I'm just getting the clips on this track. 
and I can delete them. But you'll notice that even with the shift key held down to change the way the Track Select Forward tool works, I'm still getting the audio for these clips. And those audio clip segments are separate. However, they were recorded with the original media, they were imported into Premiere Pro as part of the same media file, and Premiere Pro knows that. So when you select one part of the clip, the other part is selected as well. And this functionality is actually controlled by a little option at the top of the timeline right here. This is the linked selection mode. If I turn this option off, and now I'm holding the shift key again, so I'm just choosing one track at a time. Now, if I click, I'm just getting the video clips from this point forward on just the video one track. And if I turn linked selection back on, again, with the shift key held down, I'm getting the audio too. So now I can press the delete key, and I've removed those clips and made room for some alternatives. These are some easy ways to remove unwanted clips from your sequence in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm working with the project file 0304 Move Clips in a Sequence. You can find that project file with the media associated with this lesson. Essentially, editing is adding, removing, or moving clips in a sequence. It's common to discover your sequence would work better if you change the order the clips play in. And let's look at some ways to move clips in a sequence. I've got a very simple sequence here with five clips one after another, and they have linked audio. If I take one of these clips and drag it over the top of another clip, because I have the snapping turned on on the timeline, I know that this is going to line up at the very beginning of the clip because it's jumping into position. When I release the mouse button, a gap is left behind, and the new clip has actually overwritten. It's laid on top of the original clip that was in this position. I'll just zoom in a tiny bit more so you can see the names of those clips a little better. I'm going to undo that with Control-Z or Command-Z on macOS. And I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time I'm going to drag over to the beginning of the clip, and now I'm going to hold down the Control key here on Windows. This would be the Command key on macOS before I release the mouse. And you can see I'm getting these arrows on every track indicating that something's going to happen on those tracks. So I'm releasing the mouse now, and you can see what's happened. I still have a gap where the clip was before, but now the whole of the kids rolling a tire shot is intact. Premiere Pro has inserted the Temple From Above clip. And these are really the two ways in which you can work with clips in a sequence. You can overwrite, replacing the content that was there before, or you can insert, pushing everything out of the way. Because just as the kids rolling a tire clip has moved out of the way, so has the next clip, People Shelter From The Rain, We've got the gap that was originally there. I'm going to navigate over a little bit so you can see it. And that last shot, everything's moved along in the timeline, including the gap that the clip was in originally. Now, I'm going to undo that and just scroll over a little so you can see all of these clips. The timeline panel has a linked selection mode where you can turn off the linking between the video and the audio parts of clips for everything in the timeline panel. I'm just going to turn that feature back on though so that everything is selected together. But you also have the option to unlink individual clips. So here for example I'm going to right click on this People Shelter from the Rain clip and I'm going to choose Unlink. Right away you can see the audio is deselected and this means if I want to I can move just the video. You can see the duration of those clips was pretty similar but I've got a tiny little bit left of the clip before it. So I'm going to undo. Now of course whether or not this clip has linking enabled, I can turn off link selection for the whole sequence. And if I want to, I can take all three of these and just dragging out a marquee or a lasso selection to get the video from all three of these clips. And I can drag them over to an earlier point of the timeline. This isn't going to do much for my audio, of course, where I've left it behind. And you can see this unlinked clip isn't giving me a warning because I've told Premiere Pro not to worry about the connection between the two clips, the video and the audio. But these later clips are still linked. And so although I've turned off linked selection, Premiere Pro knows that there's a 2 second and 11 frame gap between the positions of these video and audio clips. So I'll just undo again with Control or Command Z and I'll put link selection back on. We can also break clips into pieces. This clip was just a little too long for my purposes. So I'm going to get this razor tool. And with the razor tool, I'm going to click round right about the middle of the clip to separate it into two. And then 
I'll get my selection tool and drag the clip over to overwrite the beginning of that kids rolling attire shot. But I've got a problem. If you recall, I turned off linking for the clip, which means when I clicked with the razor tool, I left the audio behind. I'm going to undo again and again. And now I'm going to select both of these. I'm going to lasso across them or marquee select across them. Right click and choose link. Now Premiere Pro knows that these two parts of the clip are connected. So I can go to the razor tool and click, go back to the selection tool. And now the audio comes with the video. Now you can move clips around in a sequence in a number of ways. As long as you remember time moves from left to right, you can plan your sequence for maximum impact. For this lesson, I'm working with the project file 0305 Simple Audio Adjustments. And you can find that project file with the media that accompanies this lesson. Double click it to open it in Premiere Pro. You'll want to make sure your audience can hear dialogue over the music by adjusting the music volume. And this is easy to do in Premiere Pro. Remember, a music clip behaves in just the same way as a video clip in Premiere Pro, but you'll be putting the clip onto an audio track, not to a video track. Here's a piece of music, and just under it, we've got some voiceover. Let's have a listen. To the land of the eternal spring. So I quite like that music, but it's a bit too loud for us to make out the voiceover clearly. To make this change, I'm going to use the audio clip mixer. You'll notice at the bottom of the audio clip mixer, we've got some names. A1, which is audio 1, A2, which is audio 2, and so on. And you'll notice that those names match the names of the tracks in our sequence. For our purposes, we're going to work on audio 1. And so that's the section of the audio mixer we want to use. Although the controls in the audio clip mixer can look a little bit strange if you're not familiar with them, notice that they're all just a repetition. Everything for audio 1 is the same as everything for audio 2, and so on. So learn one, and you've learned all of them. I'm going to adjust the audio level for the music by dragging this fader control. And I'm going to pull this down quite a bit, maybe down to minus 12. Let's have a listen to that. To the land of the eternal spring. Well, that's much better. We can easily make out the voiceover now. You'll notice as well in the audio clip mixer that we've got a mute button, which actually turns on the mute for the track. There's also a solo button. Solo makes sure that you only hear that track. For example, if I solo audio 2, I won't hear the music anymore. I'll just hear the voiceover. To the land of the eternal spring. Over on the right, you've probably noticed already we have some audio meters. So you can see the levels at work. A la tierra de mis raíces. You might decide to have vocals come from different directions. And this is easy to do using the audio pan control, which adjusts the balance for the clip. That's the balance of the audio between the left and the right speakers or headphones that you're listening on. Up in the audio clip mixer, I'm going to just click and drag to the right so that the voiceover comes out much more from the right speaker. Not 100%, but a lot more. And let's play that. To the people of the corn, who built towering cities of love. You probably saw on the meter that the right channel is louder now than the left channel. I'm going to reset that by adjusting this number under the pan control. And anywhere in Premiere Pro that you see blue numbers like this, you can click and drag, as I am now, or you can click and type. A single click will select the number. I'm going to type in a zero and press enter, and I've now reset the pan control. The audio clip mixer is based on clips. So if I had more audio clips on the timeline in my sequence, whichever clip the playhead was over would be the one that I would be adjusting. It's pretty subtle, but you can probably make out in the music clip where I've lowered the volume, this line across the middle of the clip has been dropped to a lower level. And if you watch that line while I drag the fader up, there, when you release the fader, the line moves to indicate the new volume for the clip. So you have a visual reference on the clip as well as looking at the audio clip mixer. So that's how you can easily adjust audio level and pan for clips in a sequence in Adobe Premiere Pro. For this lesson, I'm working with the project file 0401, working with image files. And you can find that project file with the media associated with this lesson.
just double click on the project file to open it in Premiere Pro. It's likely you'll want to incorporate still images and graphics in your projects. It's easy to work with this kind of material in Premiere Pro. Let's dive in and take a look. I'm going to the Media Browser panel, where I've already browsed in my storage to the media files associated with this project. But what I'm really interested in is this folder full of 1280 by 720 photos. I'm going to double click to open up that folder and let's choose one of these. I'll right click on the photo I want and choose import. The photo appears in my project panel and I can double click to open it in the source monitor or I can switch to icon view and just view it as a thumbnail. In any case, I'm going to drag this straight into my sequence. I'll put that at the end of the video clip. It's pretty short. I'm going to zoom in a little bit using the navigator at the bottom of the timeline panel. And I can see, looking at the bottom right corner of the source monitor, it's a five second clip. We're seeing here at 30 frames per second, this is four seconds and 29 frames. The last frame makes it five. To change the duration that a still image plays for, you can click on the end of the clip and drag to any length you like. You'll notice, if I just hold on to the mouse button for a moment, I'm getting an indication of how much I'm adjusting the duration and what the new total duration will be. I'll just click to line up the playhead so we can see the image in our sequence. Now what we're looking at here is a regular still image. In fact, it's a JPEG. But if I go back to the media browser and go into my media files, I've got a multi-layer Photoshop document here that I'm going to import as well. When you import a Photoshop document, an additional dialog comes up. Up at the top, I can choose Import As. And if I choose Individual Layers, I can turn off and on the checkboxes for the layers that I want. I'm going to choose Merge All Layers and click OK. And there it is in the project panel. Once again, I can double click to open it in the source monitor and I can drag this into the timeline right after the existing photo. And there it is. I'm going to drag along a little bit in the sequence here to get a gap in the timeline and go back to the media browser and back into that 1280 by 720 folder. I'm going to select the rest of these photos. I'm just holding the shift key down to make a list selection and I'm going to drag them straight into the sequence from the media browser, all four of them. When I do that, you'll notice back in the project panel, all of those photos have also been added to my project. Like all of the images we've imported so far, these have a five second duration. So I'm going to undo and undo again so they're no longer in the project. And I'm going to make a change to a preference. Here in Windows, I'm going to go to the Edit menu and choose Preferences and Timeline. This would be under the Premiere Pro menu in Mac OS. Here in this preference, you can see I've got the option to specify the default still image duration. I'm going to set this to two seconds and I'm going to click OK. Now I'm going to go back to the media browser. I'm going to take those four images and pull them in again. And right away, you can see they now have a two second duration. Remember, of course, you can change the duration to anything you want, but this can be a useful workflow if you've got a lot of images to work with. Importing image files is the same as importing video clips. The main difference is that Premiere Pro needs to know how long to play them for. You can edit them into sequences and work with them just as you would any other clip. For this lesson, I'm working with the 0402 Create a New Title project file. You can find that project file with the media associated with this lesson. Double click on it to open it in Premiere Pro. Let's create a title using the graphics workspace. I'm clicking on graphics at the top of the screen. And just to be on the safe side, I'll click on the panel menu and choose Reset to Save Layout. The Essential Graphics panel has two tabs, Browse and Edit. There's not much for us to do in the Edit tab just yet, so let's start in Browse. Here we can see a long list of pre-built graphics that we can choose to incorporate into our sequence. I'm going to take this basic lower third, and I'm going to drag this on top of the clip we have in this sequence. If a dialog pops up advising you to use Typekit to install a missing font, just make sure you're online, put a check in the box to sync from Typekit, and click Sync Fonts. The font will be installed and you'll be ready to go. You'll need to close the project and open it again for the font to display correctly. I'm lining up my playhead so we can see the title as well. Or I can just click on the end of the clip and drag it to make it a little bit longer. 
Now I'm going to select this graphic by clicking on it just once. And when I do, the Edit tab in the Essential Graphics panel becomes live automatically. I'm going to select the Type tool, and you'll notice that in this workspace, the tools for the timeline have moved up to the top of the screen. And let's edit this text. I'm going to click where it says Your Name here. And why not? I'll put Maxim Jago. And then let's edit the second line. I'm just going to press Control A, that'll be Command A on Mac OS. And let's take this travelog title. You'll notice in the Essential Graphics panel, we've got some pretty standard options for fonts and for a fill color. The fill color is the color of the text that we've got selected. And you'll notice at the top of the Essential Graphics panel, each item is a separate layer on this list. Whichever one is selected is the one you're going to edit with all of the controls in this panel. You'll notice that this T icon for the Type tool has a little tiny triangle at the bottom right-hand corner of it. And that triangle indicates that it's a menu. I'm going to click and hold, and this gives me access to both the Type tool and the Vertical Type tool. With that selected, I'll click at the top, and I'll type in some text. Now, I've typed in the word Holidays, but my text is too tall. So, let me just press Control or Command A to select all. And under the text category of controls, where my font is, I've got a font size. I'm just going to click and drag on this blue number to make that a bit smaller. There's a slider control to do the same thing right next to it. Now you'll notice in the Tools panel here, I have a pen tool. And if I click and hold under the pen tool, I have a rectangle tool. I'm going to use that to pick out a section of the screen just like this, where my text is. Of course, this new shape appears in the Essential Graphics panel, but it's at the top of the list, which isn't much good to me. I need it under my text, so I'm going to click and drag down until it's at the bottom of the list. Now it's behind my text. I'm going to select that shape layer, as it's called, and I can either give this a fill color by clicking on the color swatch and choosing something, maybe uh, green. I'll click OK. Or I can use this eyedropper. I'm going to click on the eyedropper, and now you can see, as I drag around the interface, I'm getting different colors. Let's choose the sky color. You also have the option to add a stroke. I'll just make that a little bit bigger by clicking and dragging on the number here. There we go. And a shadow if you want. There are a number of other controls in this central graphics panel. You'll find that if you select an item, either with the text tool or by going to the selection tool as I am now, you'll see you can click on each item separately. You can experiment by clicking and dragging on the controls. But I'm pretty happy with this as a start, and I'm going to go back to the editing workspace to continue working on my project. You'll notice there's a highlight on this word Traveler because I've got that item selected. I'm going to click on the background layer of the Timeline panel to deselect, and I'm ready to carry on editing. It's a good idea to try out several of the templates in the Central Graphics panel and use them as a starting point for your own designs. For this lesson, I'm using the project file 0403, Change the Size of Clips. And you can find that project file with the media associated with this lesson. Double-click to open it in Premiere Pro. Not all media that you import into your project will match the frame size of your sequence. And if your images are too big, the edges will be cropped. Premiere Pro makes it easy to change the way oversized images are handled. Let's take a look. I have a sequence here with a number of clips and images. This shot, Walking on Sands, is the right resolution for our sequence. But if we look here, we've got a shot that's much too big. This is a photograph, and it's common for photos to be much bigger than video resolutions. If I scroll down in our project panel to find it, here we go. It's this whale in the foreground shot. 4,272 by 2,848 pixels. It's pretty big. If I double-click to open this up, you can see the original composition. Not only is the image the wrong size, it's also the wrong shape. It's not 16 by 9 like regular HD video. In the timeline, I'm going to right-click on this clip, and I'm going to choose Set to Frame Size. This automatically resizes the image so that it fits in full in our sequence image resolution, which is, in this case, 1280 by 720 pixels. The horizon line is still off. It would be good if we could fix that. And the image size still isn't perfect because we're getting these so-called pillar boxes on the left and right sides of the clip. 
That's of course because it's not 16 by 9. We've got to find some way to fix that. So I'm going to make sure the clip is selected by single clicking on it in my timeline panel. And I'm going to go to a new panel, Effect Controls. The Effect Controls panel will give you options that relate to effects for each clip that you click on. And it'll only show you the settings for one clip at a time. If you have more than one item selected, you won't see anything in the Effect Controls panel, as you can see here. In fact, you just get a warning that there are multiple clips selected. So I'm going to deselect and just choose this one well in the foreground shot. I'm going to expand these motion controls in the effect controls panel. And you can see we've got some pretty standard options here to change the position on screen of the shot. We can change the scale, that's the size of it, and we can rotate it. Let's begin by fixing that horizon line. I'm going to click and drag on this rotation control to get this a little more level. In fact, I can expand the rotation control and get a more of a graphic interface to adjust this. And if I click and drag with the control key held down, I get a little bit more precision in the adjustment. I'm going to go for something like minus 1.4%. I think that pretty much works. Now I can use these position and scale controls to rearrange the composition. I'm going to start by clicking on the scale control and dragging to the right to make this a little bit bigger so it fills the screen. And then above that you can see we've got a position control with two numbers. The first number is the X position. I'll drag that so you can see left and right. And the Y position, that's the up and down. So just imagine there's an X and a Y next to these controls to get a sense of what they do. We have quite a lot of other images here as well. And they're all much too big for this sequence. But luckily, if I select all of these and right click, I can use the set to frame size option for all of them in a single step. Of course, now you'll want to make those individual adjustments to get the best possible composition from each image. But this is a quick way to get started. If you work with video clips that are oversized for your sequence, you can use exactly the same technique to resize them. For this lesson, I'm using the project file 0501 trim clips on the timeline. And you'll find that project file with the media associated with this lesson. Just double click on the file to open it in Premiere Pro. Once you have the basic structure of your edit right, you'll want to look more carefully at the precise timing of the cuts. Perfecting the timing is part of the art of video editing. Changing the part of the clip you've added to a sequence is called trimming. Let's try this. I've got a sequence open in this project, and this is a pretty reasonable edit with music, voiceover, and multiple visuals. But we want to adjust the timing. Take a look at this clip. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the timeline with the navigator here. And we can see we've got this kids rolling a tire shot and let's say I want to make the clip shorter. I want to remove part of the clip. Probably the quickest way to do this is to click and drag on the end of the clip you want to change. You'll notice as the cursor gets close to the edge of the clip, you get a, a red arrow indicating that you can trim. In one step, I'm going to click and drag. And as I do, you'll notice the program monitor updates to show the last frame of the clip I'm adjusting. You can see it's changing as I drag with the mouse. On the right-hand side of the program monitor, I'm seeing the first frame of the clip after this one. This helps me to decide on the content I want to use. I'm going to release the mouse, and the trim has been made. You'll notice that I've left a gap. I'll just move the playhead back so you can see that clip again. This is a perfectly good way to work, but it does leave a gap on the timeline, which kind of makes it a two-stage process. You need to deal with the gap, unless, of course, you put it there on purpose to add another clip. I should note that by clicking and dragging in a single step, it's a little bit faster to trim. If I single click and release the mouse, I get a trim handle. And when I drag to adjust the last frame of the clip and release, the trim handle is still there. I can click on the background of the timeline to remove that trim handle. Those trim handles are useful for more advanced trimming workflows. But we don't really need them right now. Now I'm going to go over to the Tools panel and I'm going to choose this Ripple Edit tool. I'm going to undo with Control-Z 
here on Windows or Command Z on Mac OS a couple of times to restore the clip. Let's try this again. Now I get a yellow arrow and as I click and drag everything moves along the timeline. I'm just going to undo that so you can see again. Notice that all of the clips after this one are moving and this little piece of audio down on the right is too, but not the piece of audio that's just under the end of the clip. Here we go. I'll just drag this over there. This is called a ripple trim. I'll just undo again. And now under the ripple edit tool in the tools panel, you'll see we have a couple of other options. I'm going to choose the rolling edit tool. And again, we get a different cursor. And this type of trim is going to adjust both clips at once. So as I drag, you'll notice in the program monitor, both the left and right sides are being adjusted. In fact, the rolling edit will extend one clip and shorten the other by exactly the same amount. And this means your sequence won't get longer or shorter. I'll just release the mouse and you can see the trim has been made. I'm going to click and drag again here so you can see there's a limit to how far I can move this trim. You see as I'm dragging left, the handles get left behind. And that's because there's no more media left in that forest shot. I'm going to go back to the selection tool. I'm going to line up my playhead and I'm going to use another shortcut. On your keyboard, you'll notice the Q and W keys at the top left can be used to trim as well. So I'm pressing W and everything from the playhead to the end of the clip has been removed. I'll just move the playhead out of the way so you can see. I've also, though, removed a piece of the music. I'll undo Control Z or Command Z on Mac OS so you can see that again. I'm going to click a little bit further back. And again, I'm going to press W. And you can see, if I move the playhead out of the way, I've removed a piece of the voiceover and a piece of the music. So these Q and W keys, and the Q key removes the beginning of the clip, the W key removes the end of the clip, they're really useful, but they remove content from every track, which is not perfect if you've got multiple layers of audio in this way. But we can fix that. I'm going to undo again. And now I'm going to lock those audio tracks. Over on the left, in the track header, we've got a number of lock icons, one for each track. And I'm just going to turn these on for these three tracks that aren't used for the sync audio, the audio associated with my clips. Now, no changes can be made to these tracks. You'll notice if I click and drag anywhere here, I can't even touch the clips that are on the tracks. And let's try that again. I'm now going to press the W key, and you can see the audio is left alone. Again, I'll undo. Now I'm going to press the Q key. It's going to remove the beginning of the clip. And again, nothing happens to those other tracks. I'll just undo again. It's a good idea to make sure you unlock tracks that you've locked temporarily before you continue working on your edit, just to make sure that things work as you expect them to. There are other ways to trim, but many professional editors exclusively adjust the timing of their edits this way. For this lesson, I'm using the project file 0502 trim clips in the program monitor. And you'll find that project file in with the media associated with this lesson. Double click on it to open it in Premiere Pro. If you want to get really precise with your trimming, you can use the trim mode in the program monitor. And let's take a look. If I single click on the end of a clip, when I have this red arrow cursor, I get a trim handle. But if I double click, the program monitor changes mode. This is the trim mode. And in this mode, you can click directly into the picture to trim your clips. What's nice about this is that you have a large area to click on. And you can see I've got a red arrow anywhere in this image. I can drag, release the mouse, and I've trimmed. The right-hand side of the screen's gone dark now because, of course, I left a gap. I'm going to click and drag to the right. And you'll notice I haven't let go of the mouse yet. At the bottom of the program monitor, it says trim blocked on video one. That's because there's a clip in the way. When I release the mouse, you can see we actually filled the gap. And we can't trim any further because this forest shot is in the way. I'll just go back in by double clicking on the end of this clip. And you'll notice I can drag on the right side of the program monitor as well. I actually think I trimmed the entire clip out of existence there. There's just a gap on the timeline. So I'm going to undo with Control Z or Command Z to bring it back. If I click on the middle between the two images in the program monitor, well, you can see that familiar cursor. As I drag, I'm adjusting both clips. Notice as well, if I now click on the left side of the program monitor, I've got a yellow arrow, not a red arrow. 
the yellow trim cursor indicates that it's going to be a ripple trim. I'll just click and drag, and you can see everything moves on the timeline. Let's try this with a longer clip. I'll double click to go into the trim mode, and up in the program monitor, I'll choose the rolling trim, and now I've got that yellow arrow on the left. <laughs> you can see a dramatic change on the timeline. Everything moves to fill the gap. I'll just undo that again. You can switch trim modes in the program monitor by holding the control key on Windows or the command key on Mac OS while you click in the picture. There. Just under these images in the program monitor, we've got some precise adjustment controls. So here I can trim one frame at a time, or five. I can also add frames. You can exit the trim mode by clicking anywhere in the background of the timeline. Here I'm clicking on a blank track. Editors develop a preference over time for one way of editing or another, and all approaches are valid. Sometimes you'll trim on the timeline, and sometimes you'll use the program monitor. As long as you get the results you want, you're fine. And you can always undo if you need to, so feel free to experiment. For this lesson, I'm using the project file 0503 sync locks and track locks. You'll find this project file with the media associated with this lesson. Just double click the file to open it in Premiere Pro. While developing a sequence, it's easy to click on something and make a change and then realize later you'd wanted it left as it was. Premiere Pro includes two ways to keep things as they should be on the timeline and they become more and more useful as your sequence becomes more complex. In this sequence, we've got a few tracks with some visuals. There's some video clips, there's even some titles. We've also got a couple of tracks with music and voiceover. If I trim this first clip, this great forest shot, using the ripple edit tool, all of the clips after it are going to move. Not the music clip, because it begins before the edit that I'm changing. I'm just going to undo this. I can lock the tracks that I want to protect when I trim by clicking on these lock icons. But then I've got a problem, because if I drag to adjust the timing of this edit, I'm leaving behind these voiceover clips that I do want to move with my shots. So I'll just undo. I need these voiceover clips to move with my visuals, but I'm happy for the timing of the music to change. So I'm going to unlock the Audio 3 track, and now when I trim, these voiceover clips move as well. The reason why the voiceover clips are moving at the same time as my video clips is because of an additional feature called sync locks. Here's the toggle sync lock button for the audio 3 track. I'm just going to undo, everything moves back, and I'm going to turn off the sync lock for audio 3. And now when I drag to adjust the timing of this edit, the voiceover clips stay where they are. You'll notice that the audio for the one or two clips in the sequence attached to a video clip will always move because it's a linked audio clip. Here, this Temple from the Ground linked clip will always move with its audio. Unless, of course, linked selection is turned off in the timeline. 